Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, the director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Ryan Jones, Associate Professor of History at the University of Oregon. He holds the Ann Swindles Chair and is the Director of Graduate Studies. His research interests include global environmental history, Russian history, Pacific history, and the history of Alaska. Jones is the author of Empire of Extinction, Russians and the Strange Beasts of the Sea, 1741 to 1867, published by Oxford University Press in 2014. His next book, Red Leviathan, The Soviet Union and the Secret Destruction of the World's Whales, is forthcoming from the University of Chicago Press. He is also an OHC 2020-2021 teaching fellow. Thanks, Ryan, for coming on the show. Thanks, Paul, for having me. Pleasure to be here. So you are an environmental historian. Would you tell us about a little bit about how you define that discipline and give us a sense of its evolution? Yeah, so environmental history is premised, I think, on the uncontroversial fact that humans make history uh, through the natural world and are unable to perform any actions really without interacting with all sorts of non-human objects, rivers, insects, uh, the atmosphere, etc. And uh, the discipline, I think, evolved um, in part as a protest against uh, what practitioners, what these historians saw as you know, just an over-intellectualization of history. In other words, the, the idea that uh, humans made their own history uh, precisely as they wanted to do. Um, and this just didn't seem true to a lot of people, and especially in the 1970s, you know, when environmental threats uh, had become uh, come to the forefront of at least Western consciousness, well, and Soviet, to be honest, as well. Um, you know, there was also a strong mission uh, that a lot of historians felt, and I think we still feel, to, to, to show uh, how the human relationship with the natural world has uh, been deeply problematic in the past and you know, hopefully to point towards some better possibilities for the future. So I guess two, uh, two entry points, one, a kind of intellectual dissatisfaction and also secondly, a strong commitment to changing human practices towards the natural world. So you were specifically interested in Russian Pacific and Alaskan history. So why did you get interested in those subfields? Yeah, that's a great question, Paul. I, uh, I had a long interest in Russia. I visited just after the fall of the Soviet Union in, in 1994 and uh, found it to be so totally the opposite of the uh, Californian Oregon that I had grown up in, that I was just immediately seized by a, well, to this day, unending curiosity towards this society. How do people end up so totally different um, than the society that I was used to. And I came from, um, you know, I was born in Portland, but I uh, spent a lot of time in a small town in California growing up. And uh, I decided to move to Moscow in 1999 as really the, the ultimate indifference um, in my life, a, a megalopolis of 14 million people, a place which was then actively uh, destroying itself uh, after a financial crisis. Um, you know, it was a it was a crazy time to live in Russia, and uh, it really was. It I developed a, a deep compassion for people who were living there, um, a continued interest in the way that they pursued their life, and a deepening interest in their history. You know, how how did they get to this place? And I think for a moment for me that was really transformative was was when I realized that Russians had had a deep impact on the Pacific Northwest as well through their colonial history. And, you know, at that moment, the kind of, you know, two sides, my, my desire to experience and, and learn something totally different uh, with coming together with the realization that actually Russia had played a role in my own life, in my own, in this region that I loved and whose history was, was also so interesting to me, was sort of the perfect union. You know, and and has really fueled my uh, continued research ever since. So, tell us a little bit about what's unique in the North Pacific ecologically and culturally. Yeah, I mean, the North Pacific uh, to me is such a fascinating region. I I spent time as a kid up in Alaska uh, quite frequently. Uh, I ended up traveling through the Russian Far East, places like Kamchatka, uh, Vladivostok, you know, some of the really 
distant places from the Moscow that I first got to know. And you know what, what impressed me in all of those places was the exceptional abundance of marine life in particular. You know, you go, go to a place like Alaska and certainly in, in Arctic Alaska, which is relatively bereft of, of nutrients on the land. The ocean's just the opposite. I mean, I remember kayaking off of Kodiak Island when I was finishing my first book, uh, a place where, where trees won't even grow. And I was surrounded by marine life, whales on every side, you know, krill had turned the water pink, there were sea otters, there were sea lions. And I just thought, what, what an incredible place which defied so much of my own experience, you know, of growing up in rainforests, etc. cetera. Um, you know, the ocean is the rainforest in the North Pacific and it has a history. You know, that's what also drove me uh, in my historical pursuits. I think, you know, the ocean I looked at in 2006 that I look at today in 2021 is a really different ocean than people would have uh, encountered in the 18th century, in the 19th century. And, and that's kept me going as a scholar to think there's so much we don't know. Uh, you know, people, people have commonly assumed that the ocean is unchanging, but it, nothing could be further from the truth. The ocean has experienced revolutions in its past, and you know what? We barely know what those are. With the help of science and historical research, we can start getting to the, uh, uh, to the real story. So you just mentioned your first book, Empire of Extinction, Russians and the Strange Beasts of the Sea, 1741 to 1867. So first, Tell me about that title, Empire of, Dis of Extinction. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a really compelling title. Could you gloss it a little bit? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, I meant that title in two senses. One, that when the Russians came to Alaska, starting in the 1740s, and they, they stayed through the 1860s, so you know, they had a, over 120 years of, of real direct impact um, on this region. Uh, they caused the extinction of a number of, of animals and the near extinction of a few others. They were drawn here uh, by the fur trade, trying to enter into lucrative global commerce, selling um, pelts of animals to the Chinese primarily. And so one uh, aspect of the story was the kind of rippling ecological changes that took place. Um, Perhaps the most interesting or the most compelling for me was the extinction of stellar sea cow, a gigantic manatee that used to live in the North Pacific. Uh, I, got, I got into the, that in the book a little bit, you know, thinking about various ways that this extinction might have happened. It might have been directly through overhunting. Um, the Russians used these animals for food. One uh, could apparently feed 30 men for a whole month. Um, it was an incredible source of nutrition um, and delicious, according to them as well. Uh, but it also could have been caused through complex ecological changes when the Russians removed sea otters, which encouraged the growth of kelp, uh, which destroyed the kelp forest, uh, sorry, the growth of sea urchins, which destroyed the kelp forest that the, um, the sea cow depended on, a reminder of the, the deep interconnections of uh, ecosystems under the water. So I explored the way that it, imperialism and Russian imperialism in particular kind of rearranged the North Pacific. But I meant in a second sense as well, and, and that is that it was in the North Pacific uh, that for the first time, Europeans at least really conceived of the idea, very hard to come to terms with that humans could totally end a species, cause its extinction in short. And uh, it was orthodoxy. People around the world, um, and especially in Europe, were convinced that you know, humans didn't possess the power to eliminate an entire species. Um, God had created them, or the perfect order of the universe for those who didn't believe in God, but still believed in the kind of enlightenment deism. Um, either factor meant that, look, humans had no power uh, to ultimately rearrange that the, the perfect harmony of the universe. And it was really in the North Pacific where they first changed their minds. Um, and it was because, um, frankly, because there was such a great anti-Russian prejudice um, in the 18th century world that they were saying, yeah, extinction is possible, but you know, Russians are really awful people. They could have caused this extinction. So uh, we're prepared to believe it. And so it was this interesting historical moment of, uh, you know, ecological changes combining with intellectual history um, to produce really kind of a breakthrough in human understanding of the natural world ever since extinction has been you know the forefront of our understanding of the way that humans can impact 
the natural world. It's, uh, you know, we, we now understand that the extinction of the sea cow was the beginning of what scientists call the sixth great extinction. So I know from the research that we've done on your work that um, there were naturalists who were involved in the colonial project, but also who played a role in this coming into consciousness that humans could cause an extinction. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the role of the naturalists at the time. Yeah, there were some of my favorite figures here. And you know, one of the one of the things I've the topics I've pursued in both of my books is to try to untangle, to try to to show the the connections that Russia has always had with uh, the rest of the world, with the globe, with globalization, and especially with the oceans. People think of Russia as a huge landed empire, and it is, of course, but it also has one of the largest coastlines in the world, and it's been a major player in the oceans. Uh, and so the naturalists fit into that story, and the fact that, um, you know, Russians hired uh, mostly German scientists, as we call them now, natural historians, as they were called then. And uh, they did this for a number of reasons, reasons of prestige, uh, so, uh, underdeveloped um, in the Russian own mind educational system. They weren't producing enough of their own uh, naturalists. And so these, these Germans played a really interesting role of being both very supportive of the Russian empire they didn't question the ultimate kind of rightness of Europeans uh, expanding across the globe, uh, exploring exotic environments. And yet they harbored a kind of general uh, and widespread suspicion of Russia for its tyranny as they saw, you know, the, these horrible rulers like Peter the First, Peter the Great, Catherine the Second, even though Catherine paid for a lot of their salaries, they also had a kind of sense that, um, you know, the, the system of government there was somehow far worse than their own German governments. And so they were, they were uh, ready to, at both, while both supporting Russian imperialism, they were ready to criticize it in ways that they wouldn't have criticized, say, British um, exploration, which was just as ecologically ruinous um, as was the Russians. So, uh, you know, they developed this this idea that you know Russians, um, for whatever their the good sides, they were really horrible ecologically, um, and that was actually a pretty powerful critique for people at the time. They they saw this as a real indictment of the Russian Empire. Um, but but they're fascinating characters, the risking life and limb to travel all across Siberia to get to uh, the North Pacific, to get to Alaska, even down to California. Many of them didn't make it back, died of diseases or shipwreck on the way. Uh, a reminder of just how, how risky exploration was back then. So another set of characters that are important in your story is, is the indigenous people of mm -hmm. the Arctic. Say a little bit about how the Russians interacted with them and, and the, ro the role that they play in your story. Yeah, this is one of the more controversial aspects here. If you, if you ask uh, any Russian, they'll tell you that they're, uh, they treated native people without a trace of racism in contrast to the Americans um, and other Europeans. And you know what, I'm not ready to disregard that entirely. Race was not a big issue for Russians. Uh, they certainly looked down on um, the people they colonized, mostly the Aleuts and the Aleutic people, the people who live in Kodiak Island. They're the ones that I really deal with in the book. Uh, they never were willing to, con to say that these people are as civilized as we are. Uh, and yet they saw them as completely uh, assimilable. In other words, they could uh, become Russians over time. And in fact, the Russians deliberately protected their interests, um, seeing them as key uh, to their empire. They relied on Aleuts and uh, Aleutic people to hunt sea otters. And they were very, um, they very deliberately um, advanced indigenous people within the ranks of the empire uh, to make sure that they were invested in it and bought into it. Like, like, like any story, it's full of ambivalence and ambiguity. Um, I won't, I'm not prepared to say the Russians somehow were benign colonizers. They weren't, uh, but their, their practices differed in substantial ways uh, from other Europeans. And in fact, you know, the Russian Empire responded to the claims that they were bad, uh, the environmental managers. Uh, and they, they responded to them in part because they cared about the well being of uh, Alaska's native people. And they instituted quite strict conservation measures of sea otters in the 19th century. Uh, and they did this because they said, we, we can't let these people starve to death. Uh, 
uh, we need the revenue. I mean, look, I'm, it wasn't just benevolence, there's no question. Um, but you know what, the fact that we have sea otters today in the North Pacific, it's probably at least in part due uh, to the fact that the Russians realized that this was a real problem. They weren't, they weren't prepared to just say, fine, sea otters are gone, let's move on to something else. They wouldn't accept that. So um, the first book, Empire of Extinction, focuses on uh, the 18th and the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But the forthcoming book, uh, Red Leviathan, elaborates that story into, uh, up into history, into the Soviet era. So tell us a little bit about that part of the story. How did the Soviets engage with that region? Yeah, you know, my, I, I guess through, through my research for this first book and travels to various places, uh, you know, I saw a lot of whales, I encountered a lot of whales, and I, I grew more and more interested in these creatures who, you know, seem to me have, have their own history uh, a history that really needed to be told, and especially the you know the 20th century history of whales is you know, amongst the the most tragic history of any species in, in history. You know, whales uh, were nearly wiped out, various species of whales by commercial whalers, and you know it was it was uh, the work of of the whole world, Japanese, British. Um, and uh, Norwegian whalers in particular were at the forefront of this. But the Soviets played a major role, especially after the Second World War. And, uh, you know, the Soviets, um, so the Russian Empire had a long history of, of seeing Americans, Norwegians coming to their shores, killing their whales. Uh, and they were very critical of this. And, and they felt that they'd been victims for a very long time. And a big part of the story, the reason that the Soviets entered the whaling industry after the Second World War in a major way uh, was, first of all, to try to, to feed a war-torn nation that was starving in many places. Whales were turned into margarine, um, by and large. Uh, but also, um, it's hard not to see it, in a sense, as a, as a, a revenge whaling. In other words, um, the Soviet Union felt it was finally their time. They'd been taken advantage of for far too long. And uh, they sent, they, they built massive whaling fleets, um, especially in the late 50s and 60s, sent them down every year to the Antarctic and to the North Pacific and caught huge numbers of by then very rare whales, lied about it um, to the rest of the world. For example, um, in the early 1960s, they would sail down to the Antarctic, they would catch humpback whales, a whale that most people are probably familiar with, you know, jumps out of the water a lot, a uh, really charismatic whale. Um, it's hunting had been nearly forbidden by the early 1960s because it was so rare and Soviets would go down there uh, mostly whaling south of New Zealand and Australia. Uh, they'd kill, well they'd come back and report having killed two or three hundred humpbacks within season. They'd killed 12,000 and that was nearly the coup de grace uh, for big whales around the world what the Soviets did. Their years, decades long campaign of eradicating the last of these wells. It's, um, some people have called it the, the environmental, the worst environmental crime of the 20th century. Um, I, after writing this book, I'm not sure that that's the case, but I think it's a contender. I know that when you went to Russia at the, in the post-Soviet period, you met some of these whalers. I did. And um, you, you tell us about your responses, what you, what the experience of meeting them was like, because you, you know, you've just suggested there's this kind of deeply problematic ethical aspect of, of what the Soviets did, but tell us about the, what it was like to meet these people. Yeah, Paul, thanks. That's, um, you know, the, this, this book, which I, I just finished last month, uh, was a very difficult book to write in some ways. You know, you get involved deeply with your research subjects. And I, I had two subjects in this book. I had the whales, right? Which is why I started writing this book. I felt like someone, there needed to be, there's, their story needed to be told. Right? What, what was it like uh, to see almost every co-companion uh, slaughtered around you? It was, it was awful. And there's, there's, there's good evidence that it was awful for whales. Uh, we have records of um, hormonal changes, for example, that show exceptionally high stress levels in the 60s. Um, you know, my sympathy only grew for what whales had experienced. On the other hand, 
as you mentioned, I, I met these people right, who, who did a lot of this whaling. I met ex-whalers. They were super excited to tell me their story. They were incredibly gracious to me when I visited places like Odessa in the Ukraine and uh, Vladivostok on the Russian Pacific. They uh, went through really hard times when whaling ended and when the Soviet Union ended. The Russians stopped whaling in 87, the Soviet Union ended in 91. Many of these men were thrown into abject poverty. Uh, their memories of, way, of whaling were almost universally positive. And of course, in some way I couldn't, I, I understood why, right? They, experienced what we might think of as the best of the Soviet Union. Well-paying jobs, they got to see the world, their labor felt meaningful, they were supplying people back at home with food. And yet, you know, the more I researched this book too, and the more I read their journals from the time, I realized that their their actual experience of this was they were they were deeply anguished many times. You know, the idea that it's only us in the in the West from the 70s that started loving whales. It's not true, actually. Those people who killed whales, they, I mean, they literally climbed inside their bodies. They saw their unborn fetuses inside these whales. They often broke down in tears over what they were doing. They, even though they were all atheists, some of them said, look, this is a sin, what we're doing. And so I had to, re I had to wrestle with kind of their, their, these men's memories of what they'd done in the 70s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s with their, with the, with their actual impressions at the time. Uh, it's a deeply complex history. Can you give us a sense of the nature of post-Soviet involvement in the far reaches, I mean, in this area and in the far mm -hmm. reaches of Russia? Yeah, you know, one of the things that happened was with the end of the Soviet Union was uh, uh, the end of subsidies for places like Chukotka, uh, much of the Russian Far East, the drawdown of the naval uh, strengths, uh, which took money out of the area. And probably no place in the former Soviet Union was impacted as negatively as the Russian Far East, the broad, you know, the broad region from going up from Korea to the Arctic. And it's been a really hard time. One of the, one of the ways that the native people in Chukotka, the Chukchi, made it through was relearning to whale. Uh, they they reestablished contact with Yupik and Inupiat people in Alaska, um, who've been you know who whaled this entire time, and uh, they they took lessons from them. And in the 90s, they returned to hunting um, mostly gray whales off the coast of Chukotka, which by many accounts was the only reason that many of them survived. Uh, so Russia still whales today, only uh, this, only the Aboriginal hunt, which is allowed by the International Whaling Commission. They take about 200, uh, mostly, as I said, mostly gray whales every year. Very different, of course, from what the Soviets were doing. It's a much smaller scale. It's almost entirely used for local subsistence. So you are also an Oregon Humanities Center 2020-2021 teaching fellow, mm -hmm. and obviously, therefore, a teacher. So will you tell us a little about um, your teaching and, and the kinds of courses that you teach? And maybe you can tell us about the course that you uh, got the fellowship for. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I spent years teaching down in Auckland, New Zealand before I came back to Oregon. It's been a great homecoming, by the way. I've really enjoyed being here. And I've, I took back from Auckland a, a deep interest in the Pacific Islands, which uh, play a role in my history of the Soviet Union. So I, I teach history of the Pacific Islands. And I also teach Soviet history, uh, Imperial Russian history, and uh, global history. So I, I, you know, my focus is is always. I'm really attracted by these big, big histories, and within that, um, you know, I teach a history of the Pacific Ocean. It's a course that I initially developed to teach to, in New Zealand. And you know the Pacific is a third of the globe, so uh, it is feels like a pretty big class in its own way. And in this class, I, it's it's my favorite class to teach. I try to show students, and I try to further uh, my own research here to to think about how the oceans are a side of history. You know how how have the oceans changed over the last, especially three hundred years? And it's it's tricky. 
it's hard to get to that, but there are ways of doing it. And it's really by combining science and historical research uh, that one can begin to understand the way that uh, large scale and small scale transformations have taken place in the Pacific. And it reveals to us a couple of things. First of all, the ocean's always changing. The ocean we look at today is very different, but also that the ocean connects us to distant people in really interesting ways. Uh, there are so many migratory species in the ocean. Uh, I'll just take whaling as one example. It's something I get into in the class. Um, you know, whales which migrate up and down the coast of California, gray whales in particular, uh, mean that uh, during the classical age of whaling in the US, the 19th century, whales which were killed in, in Mexican waters would dramatically impact the lives of Inupiat as well as uh, Macaw uh, in Washington state, um, showing us that you know, to understand anything that's happening around the ocean, we really have to think about the ocean itself. Uh, and we have to trace those changes. And that's the kind of thinking that I try to encourage in this class. And Oregon, the Oregon Humanities Center was kind enough to uh, help fund uh, me to, to retool this course to really speak to Oregon. Um, because, uh, you know, the, the history of the oceans around Oregon remained to be written. Um, this is something that I, I learned in my research uh, on this grant, visiting museums up and down the Oregon coast. Uh, we know almost nothing about the history of our waters here. Uh, and there's, there's all sorts of material there. We will, this, this history will be written, and I think we're going to understand our place uh, in the Pacific in an entirely different way once we understand the way our oceans have changed in the past. Well, Ryan, I want to thank you. That's a great point for us to end on. It's been a real pleasure talking with you today. Likewise, Paul. I appreciate it very much. I've been speaking with Ryan Jones, Associate Professor of History at the University of Oregon. He holds the Ann Swindles Chair in the History Department, and he is a, uh, an OHC 2020-21 Teaching Fellow. Thanks so much for watching.